Piketty has tapped brilliantly into the contemporary malaise in the advanced world. Uh, we, whoops, oh no, oh here we are. If I was to try and put up what the contemporary malaise in the advanced world is, it might go something like this. There are three post-war decades, from the end of the Second World War to the middle 1970s, where everything goes swimmingly well. Growth, equality, effective welfare states, unions, even social democracy. And then, uh, a common view is that an awful lot goes wrong. So I've just literally put up six things which uh, many people see as going wrong after that, between then and the, and the present. Now, <coughs> uh, I very much share Piketty's preoccupation with inequality, yet his analysis from the egalitarian post-war decades to the contemporary advanced world is really quite mechanistic, mechanistically based on the famous R greater than G formula uh, and on the wealth to GDP ratio. Now he adds to this the results on top incomes in the, in the US and the UK, but he has at most a very limited explanation for them. Uh, of course, I would have loved to have written a book as successful as Piketty's book. So don't, don't think this is just sour, sour grapes, as well you might think, but... Um, despite his emphasis, I'm going to talk a lot about politics and how it relates to economics, but despite his emphasis on the importance of institutions, of politics and history, he says all along how how you, you, you can't do economics without understanding about politics, they played virtually no role in his analysis of the period from the 1970s to the, to the present. His exogenous variable in his book is simply the fall in the growth rate uh, of GDP so that it falls below the rate of interest R. Actually, none of these factors here, apart from the fact that growth rate falls, play any role in his, in his analysis. Um, I, I'm very much concerned to be able to explain the increase in multiple dimensions of inequality. All sorts, but inequality has certainly risen hugely since the, since the 1960s, 70s. Poverty has increased. Top incomes have become very large in the US and the UK. Uh, the Gini coefficient has increased. Inequal inequality of pre-market income has increased. Redistribution has declined and, and so on. I'm really concerned to be able to explain this. We certainly live in a world of deep social cleavages and inequality. And a major part of this talk will be in understanding where these cleavages and inequality come from. But there is another huge side to contemporary advanced societies. Population in the advanced societies in, in the West have a very high level, in fact, in historical terms, unparalleledly high level of education. We live in a world at the moment where uh, in uh, most advanced economies, uh, more than 50% of current cohorts go through some form of higher education. And 80 to 90% complete secondary education. Now, for you this will be, this is normal, this is the way the world is. <clears throat> but nothing like this 
has been seen before in human history. The last 20 or 30 years are completely unparalleled in terms of the level of education which modern economies uh, are providing. <clears throat> um, even the post-war, if we go back to the post-war decades, I'm, I'm going to do that in a second. If we go back to the post-war decades, the level of <clears throat> the amount of people who went through higher education was really very limited. Let's have a look at, let's have a look at some um, data. It's on slide eight. Whoops. Seven. Uh, sorry. So just have a look at this data <coughs> here. So one, one way of starting to look at this data is looking at the number of people who got a higher, uh, an advanced degree during the course of any year. And, and you may be interested to see that in 1920, only 174 women got an advanced degree. That's to say a master's degree or a doctorate. But if you move forward to even as late as 1960, you'll see not very much had changed. It had gone up from 174 to 279. And if you look at the number of men, actually that's it's pretty low compared to now, uh, <clears throat> but there was a certain gender bias in the figures. So the number of men who had advanced degrees was just about 10 times more than the number of women who had advanced degrees. Uh, pretty similar striking figures in terms of first degrees, undergraduate degrees. In 1960, the number of women undergraduates who actually graduated in 1960 was 5,575, uh, one third or so of the men who graduated in that year. Now come forward to the present. And in two, 2011, you can see for the first time, women actually had more advanced degrees than men. So there are two things about this figure here. And if you look, in 2011, 97, 1,990 women got advanced degrees from UK universities. 96,280 men got advanced degrees from UK universities. So uh, women here, don't worry, you, you're, you're, the, you're, you're very clearly the future. Uh, what's striking is both this huge, and we'll, we'll come on to this in looking at the, the knowledge economy, there's both been this huge increase, gender, huge gender shift from the post-war period to the present, and there's been an absolutely massive increase in the amount of higher education. So <clears throat> you can see it's even, more, it's even more, in terms of the, what's happening to first degree, it's even more, more striking. Around 200,000 women get first degrees in the, in the UK. Uh, uh, roughly at the moment, whereas about 150,000 men get them. So we have overtaken men by a large amount as far as first degrees are concerned and are overtaking men <coughs> as far as higher degrees are concerned. Now, I, I, I don't think men need to worry totally about this, but it's very clear that we've got to get our act together and work out how to, uh, how to, deal, with, to, to deal with this. But this is, this is just one illustration of this amazing change in education which has taken place. It's true, it, something like this is true pretty much right across the advanced world. It took place slightly earlier in the States, but that's the, that's the only qualification. If I look, here's, an, here's another way of looking. If you look at pupils in full-time education in schools, Roughly, if you, if, you take, uh, <clears throat> if you take the age, age seven, 16 or 17, 16 is the, is the brighter line, is the darker line, 17 is the lighter line, you can see that right up to 1970, 
the number of pupils in full-time education in the UK was just about 20%. Whereas, of course, nowadays it's up to 70%, and it's, uh, it's actually still it's actually growing over this, over this later, later period. So we've moved as far as full-time education in secondary schools from most people, the large proportion of people, leaving school at the age of 15 or 16 to a totally different situation nowadays. So... <clears throat> One real question is, what, is, what has happened? Um, well, there's many, many ways in which society has changed from this post-war period, even more so from the pre-war the pre-war period uh, to, the, to the present. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to go through quite a lot of them, but one other way, which is a very, very noticeable way when you look at from a sociological perspective at the way in which modern society works, particularly in large cities, and we'll focus actually a lot on large cities, is tolerance. Um, and one measure of, one measure, measure of tolerance is, is, um, is homosexuality. And when you're making this comparison, in the middle of the 1960s, male homosexuality, acts between consenting adults, was still a criminal offence. It was actually a serious criminal offence. And then things gradually started to change. Uh, you may or not be interested to know that lesbianism has never been a criminal offence in this country, the, uh, the, 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 the story is, but it's not true, that uh, when Queen Victoria was asked to sign uh, a legislation on this, she refused to on the grounds that she couldn't possibly imagine such a thing taking place. <laughs> now, that happens not to be true. It happens to be the case that uh, no governments have ever proposed making... This was as... Uh, the, the, uh, as some modern, modern feminists would use that. This would be unspeakable. So uh, it certainly didn't mean there was very much tolerance uh, for this in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 19th century or indeed up until the, the post-war period. And then gradually tolerance has increased and what you find when you look geographically at different areas, particularly big cities, you find there's a hugely greater degree of tolerance for all sorts of diversity than there is in small cities, small towns, rural areas, and, and so on. So that tolerance goes very closely, in fact, uh, with, uh, with higher education uh, and, <coughs> uh, and other things, as we will as we'll see. Now, a very brief... Um, brief thing on this period from the from the late 19 from the 1940s to the 1970s this was a period of um, of so-called uh, Fordism where big there were huge huge car, huge car plants and other <coughs> plants using using assembly lines <coughs> employed very large numbers uh, of people the, there were some skilled workers, an awful lot of semi-skilled workers. And one very important thing to take into account in comparing the, the present with this period here is this. In these post-war decades of these very big car plants, um, these were plants which this was a system which provided a pretty egalitarian outcome for incomes just in the market. These huge car plants were very easy to unionize. Semi-skilled workers were in very powerful <coughs> positions, even if they didn't have very, very well-developed skills. Uh, <coughs> and their strength led to uh, collective, but led to unionization, collective bargaining, and wage compression. 
So the system of collective bargaining during that period led to a, led to a relatively egalitarian outcome, obviously leaving aside uh, other parts of the economy. But what's particularly interesting is, and this makes a big difference between then and now, is that it was possible with, with, with a, an economic system which demanded as many, uh, as many semi-skilled workers as possible. These were male workers because, they were, because these jobs required physical strength and, and st stamina. So it was relatively easy to integrate a potentially very problematic group uh, in, in the population, which is young males with weak education, uh, low social skills from disadvantaged backgrounds. Since semi-skilled work requires physical stamina, but relatively few social skills or much education. So the way the system worked in the post-war period was it pulled in an awful lot of males, particularly young males, into the productive system. And the result of that was that you both had a low rate of unemployment. And at the same time as that, you had relatively low poverty because uh, even people with, uh, from relatively disadvantaged backgrounds could get relatively reasonable jobs. And the major point to make from that is that now we've moved to a world where you need to have social skills and you need to have uh, some education to get a job at all. We've moved to a world where the market no longer supplies these relatively equitable solutions. So we've moved from a world, the three post-war decades, where the labor markets themselves provided relatively egalitarian solutions to a world now where labor markets don't do that, the skills are very important and very differentiated, to a world where we now, if we're going to have egalitarian solutions, we have to rely on the political system and the government to provide them. And one of the punchlines of this talk will be how difficult it is to persuade democratic governments to provide uh, high levels of redistribution to eliminate this sort of, this sort of poverty. Um, okay, let me let me get on to ba ba ba. Oh, sorry. Now, the title of the talk is knowledge economies, and I, I I think it really makes a lot of sense to say that we live in knowledge economies where a large proportion of the population are pretty well educated, and there's a real problem therefore for the proportion of the population who are not, who are not well educated. Uh, knowledge economies though are about a lot more than just education. Uh, they can be seen as economists would say as concerned with a set of strategically complementary variables. Certainly true we have high level proportion of participation in higher education we also have a huge amount of foreign direct investment by knowledge-based multinationals coming into this economy to tap knowledge resources in this economy, just as our knowledge-based multinationals uh, have foreign direct investment abroad to tap into knowledge bases uh, in other advanced economies. <coughs> Urban living, particularly urban living in large cities, is becoming more and more important, and it's more and more, on average, related to high levels of education and higher levels of income. Moreover, the way in which society is organized in large cities is uh, what are very often called in terms of skill clusters, clusters of professionals, social networks which are formed on the basis of partners, families, and, and so on. So we have very networked big cities socially where, I was just afraid to say Warwick is a bad example of this, but, 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 but bear with me. People go to the LSE, they meet their partner at the LSE. 
I, I don't mean to say that the LSE is simply set up in order to, to, to do this. They meet their part of the LSE. Now, very likely, they're going to be doing different things. It might be, I don't know, a, 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 an econ a, a woman who's an econometrician and a man who's studying uh, Renaissance literature, let's say. <laughs> now, <coughs> they're going to go for different, different careers. But London is a great place, if you're together, to go for different careers because there are so many different jobs available in London. So one of the functions which universities in big cities play is they generate, I hope that, oh, this, is being, this, is being, this is being recorded, this is really, really bad. <laughs> I, I'm, can I just say to the, I, I'm not talking about the LSE, of course. Um, <laughs> One of, the, one of the ways in which these social networks get to be set up in big cities, very closely connected to people who've been to university together, uh, have relationships, have set, sets of friends, have social networks, but then they also will be in skills in... in uh, in professions or in sectors such as software where they have they will develop professional relations as well so you have very tightly knit networks sort of knitted together across uh, across cities like like London uh, which has uh, which has various uh, various important effects as we'll as we'll see let me um, <coughs> go uh, let, let me say say one one more thing which is that a lot of this of these changes really took place that there seems to have been a major acceleration of change in the 19 in the 1990s and 2000s uh, particularly as far as we've seen already seen with with uh, I go back to you know, whoops I go back to university participation, you can actually see that the really big change starts in, I mean, things are increasing up to 1990, but then there are really big changes during the 1990s and, two, and in, the two, in the 2000s. Actually, it turns out that these big changes occur in a whole number of different areas. This acceleration occurs in a whole number of different areas. Let me just give you... Sorry. If you look at foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment is that continuous line which is relatively low up to 1990, and then it shoots up. That's one example. Here's another example. If we look at patents in the United States, this goes back an awfully long way, and you can see it's a little bit misleading because the American population is actually increasing a great deal during a lot of this period. You can see there's a long period from the late 19th century, uh, then falls a bit in the 1930s, but picks up again in the 1950s and 19, 1960s uh, up to about 1970, which was the world of actually it was the world of large Chandlerian companies. Uh, where most of the most of the most of the patents were, were done on a on a big company basis, you then have a big slip. You can see from about 1970 through to about 1990, and then we move into a very different world, which is a world in which a lot of innovation is done in very small companies, in startups, and so on. And that again, you can see, absolutely shoots up in the in the 1990s. And then here's another very interesting thing. Oops, sorry. <coughs> it's not a very widely known fact, but the number of regulatory agencies 
has also increased hugely in the past 20 years. And that reflects the fact of the increasing complexity and the pace of innovation of products and the great difficulty of having products which are, which are simply run through completely free markets. So we have a world also where you can see from here that this, period, this 1990 period is a period when regulation speeds up at a, at a regulatory agency speed up at a great, at a great rate. Now, to if we take this, if we take this modern, if we take this modern world, uh, how, how long should I, Vera? Where, where are you? Oh, twenty minutes more. That's fine. Good. That's lovely. Uh, if we take this modern world we live in, we can also look at what's happened to the way in which jobs work. So if we were to go right back to the post-war period, what you'd find is that actually most jobs were pretty standardized <coughs> jobs. Tasks were very well defined. Uh, there was not very much room <coughs> left for discretion. Here the term which is used is tailorized workers, and you can see in some countries there are still quite high levels of tailorized, tailorized workers <coughs> instead of Fordist workers. But the number of creative workers, to say where workers have significant discretion in their employment to solve problems and so on and so forth, that's really become, at least for the advanced countries, the dominant form of work. In fact, every country which has over 50% of creative workers, uh, apart, from, apart from Slovenia, I think, and Estonia, uh, has a high proportion of creative, creative workers. So we've moved into a world from a situation in which employment was very much task-related, pretty boring, to a world in which uh, what employers want are creative workers. So it's no, it's no surprise, as it were, that you've had a rise in participation in higher education, which has gone along with a rise in the requirements which employers have for the skills of, the, of, their, of their workforce. Again, this two sides coming together uh, of, um, of, the, of the knowledge economy. And we can, oops, oops. yeah, here we are. We can go one stage further than this. And this is a table which basically uh, looks at the extent to which new jobs being created over the past, over the period of century from, 19, from early 1990s to 2008, 2009 or so. The jobs which are being created job, uh, are divided into five categories, starting with the lowest paid jobs uh, in 1990 and going up to the highest paid jobs in 1990. And what you can see is the, the black lines going up relate to the jobs which are created in the highest paid <coughs> categories. So that a very, the, 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 the category of jobs which has increased by most during this 20 year period have been these jobs in the highest categories uh, in, 19, in 1990. Actually, what's one thing which is interesting is that the UK is the only one of these countries where there's actually a small increase in jobs at the bottom. So these are, the UK is, is sort of successful at getting very, very badly paid jobs, increasing as very, very well paid, as very well paid jobs. Um, let me go on now to ask the question, um, so how do knowledge, how do knowledge economies work and um, 
I think my, my position, which is a position that's very widely, <coughs> widely shared by uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, economists and geographers and so on, is that the key difference, the key change which has taken place over the past 50 years has been a huge shift in the technological regime. And that huge shift has been, been to do with the information technology revolution. And that has affected pretty much, uh, pretty much every sector of, uh, of economic activity. And it's called, in the language which is used, it's called a general purpose technology. Uh, it can be used for in pretty much every type of economic activity you can think of. And you really have to go back to electricity to go back to the previous general purpose technology uh, which, was, uh, which, was, um, which was invented. And if you go back to electricity, it's very, it's very interesting because it takes a very long time for a new technology, particularly if it can be used everywhere, to permeate right throughout the whole economy. In fact, in, 19, in 1827, Michael Faraday invented the first electrical motor. So electricity was invented in 1827. But electricity was nowhere there being universally adopted until well after the First World War. So there you have a, roughly speaking, a hundred year period before electricity, sort of the most obvious general purpose technology, gets adopted right across the spectrum. And if you think of information technology, as probably starting, well, during the Second World War, it started very slowly, and uh, the um, uh, miniaturized circuits really only come in at the, during the 1960s. We've got, in principle, a very long, uh, a long period to go with, with, uh, with, with information technology. Now, what's interesting about the information technology is, what does information technology enable you to do? Well. It enables, it enables people to, to access, uh, access the uh, computers, the internet, get information out. And above all, it gives, the, it gives people the ability to take decisions on their own. So if you're using, techno using information technology in an effective way, what you're doing, what you want to be doing, is you want to give smart individuals the ability to use information technology to make smart decisions. So giving people discretion, creating creative workers, makes a great deal of sense in a world uh, where we have access to, uh, to, to, to computers. But if I ask the question, why do, why do women do particularly well as a result of the IT revolution? Well, one thing is uh, you, can't just have, you can't just have boys just looking into computer screens. I, I, people sometimes say that happens. I'm sure it's not true. Uh, what happens, what you need to do to take decisions is you have people who are both working, as it were, on their own computers, and people working on other computers who then have to coordinate decisions. And one of the, what, what's become very clear in the, uh, in the in information technology revolution is it's not just about individuals, it's also about the social skills which are needed in enabling people using computers to coordinate decisions. So <clears throat> women, first of all, do, uh, <laughs> there is quite a lot of evidence about, about this. Uh, women, first of all, do better than men do on average. These are overlapping distributions. Don't, 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 don't worry, I'm just reassuring my, my friends. Uh, these are overlapping distributions. But this has given a big advantage to women to uh, in um, uh, in relation to in relation to men uh, on on average, and the other aspect of computer technology, 
uh, is that no physical strength is required for it. So you could say it's not really surprising that the information technology revolution has so relatively boosted the position of women relative to men. And all these things, that the, the return which you get uh, from, uh, from education very clearly increases your ability to use computers effectively, to, just to uh, at, at a low level, to work out solutions with other people who are using computers. And so the, we very quickly can see why both jobs have changed, the nature of jobs have changed, and why the, why the way in which higher education works has changed both for men and for, and for women. Now, if, I, if you go down these things here, the, if you look at the third of these entries, the need to develop specific interpersonal relations and network across work environments, because tacit knowledge, a knowledge which can't be literally codified and used, an organizational path dependency are central to modern innovation. That's what modern innovation works very much on the basis of people now working quite closely together to work out, uh, to work out whatever the area of innovation which they're, they're in is concerned. And that, this leads to the concept of workplace co-location, that skills, people work together in the same, in the same place. Uh, the result of this is that it's very difficult for companies to move, to, to move their whole workforce to, from one place to another. So a very, a very important element of the way in which knowledge economies work is that uh, a company which wants to tap into a particular set of skills very likely has to go to a very to a particular place, to a particular geographical place in order to in order to do so. Uh, that means that it can't simply threaten to leave uh, a place. There was a, a great example of a hedge fund a hedge fund employing six people in London, which where the person who was running the hedge fund got very cross with the English tax rules and said uh, said to the government, it's reported in the Financial Times, we're going to leave London and go to, to Zurich. Uh, and his six employees refused to go. And they were his intellectual capital. And they refused to go because their partners had jobs in London. Moreover, all their friends in London who worked in other hedge funds would every now and then say, look, there's going to be a job here. Why don't you apply for that? So your whole basis of bargaining with your employer depended very much in being a place, being in a city where there were a lot of hedge funds in operation so that you could use your networks in order to bargain up your position. So whereas there is one view of the modern world which says, talks about footloose capitalism, there's another view of the modern world which says, no, capital isn't footloose. Capital, if we're talking about knowledge-based multinational enterprises and their subsidiaries, they're pretty pinned down to a limited number of areas. So let me just now go on to, uh, to look at how do these, whoops, sorry. How does this work in in, in, uh, in practice. How does everything tie together? These are a whole lot of, lot of uh, aspects which are the things which, are, which show complementarities within the, within the system of modern knowledge economies. So think of a big city which has got a lot of, a lot of higher educated people in it working in different sectors and so on in that city and the first impact the IT revolution has 
uh, really been in changing the nature of innovation and of goods. So, not, so as compared to the dreadful standardized goods which uh, one had in the 1950s and 1960s, we now have goods which are highly sophisticated, a lot of variety, a lot of customization, uh, and a lot of innovation of products and organizational technologies. And this applies for goods and services. We live in a world which is, uh, I wish I could transport you back to the 1950s and the sorts of car, first of all, there were, uh, no, no, Andrew, you were still, you were still a, a baby then. Uh, you, you were. <laughs> uh, there were a limited, there were a very limited number of choices of, of cars. Uh, if you lived in England, the cars all went wrong after a short, short period of time because they were rather, rather bad. I hope this isn't very politically incorrect to say it to the industrial relations department here. Uh, and the, the idea of variety or much innovation was not, was not what, was, what was on the cards. Um, and that was true actually of most services which one, which one, which one had. Um, so the, there has been a sea change in what you can buy, uh, at what you can buy and all the complexities which you can do, the things which you can buy in the, in the modern world. If you then take the arrow from that box up, that then changes the employment skills which are demanded by companies getting these employment skills requiring more and more creativity and so on. That in turn leads to the higher education rate for both genders increasing as younger people see that they've simply got to get through, uh, through university if they're, going to, if they're going to get a halfway decent, uh, de have a halfway decent career. And that in turn, this university route leads to these urban skill clusters and research university social networks which then go backward and forward with this type of innovation. Now there's a very important box in the middle of this, which is the sophisticated non-trading traded urban services sector. Uh, this is a hugely, hugely important se sector. So this is health, schools, restaurants, art, all the way in which in a sophisticated urban center People, people live. They they form that their entertainment, their culture, and and so on and so forth. So, a large number of the jobs which actually get created as a result of this process are in that sheltered sector, sophisticated sheltered sector. There, let me just move on briefly. Now, <clears throat> it's often thought that financialization is a uh, is a bad. Thing Paul Krugman does, and um, generally one agrees with Paul Krugman. But when you actually ask the question, how would you expect find the financial system to adjust to a world in which uh, people are moving around the whole play the whole time? It's a world in which people don't have sta standard careers and standard lives any any more. They need to move. They need to buy things. They mortgages, etc., etc., in very, in more and more complicated ways, then it's not very surprising that we live in a world where financial institutions have become more and more flexible in order to cope with that. The same is true of the, sh of the switch from very large managerial corporations, which simply supplied the finance to do their own innovation, to a world in which uh, a lot of the finance for innovation is now done uh, through financial institutions, venture capital, and so on. Now add the rest of the world into this. So it's, it's going to come to, this, this will come to an end eventually. <laughs> now add the rest of the world into this, and you can see that the intensity of world product market competition and world levels of innovation and product development impact hugely on what's going on in any one economy. 
but th that comes back as well into the world economy. So we have a complex interaction between of FDI into and out of the, uh, of the United Kingdom and other advanced countries. Whoops. <laughs> and this is simply saying that knowledge is embedded and distributed across knowledge economies. And now here's the bad side of all this. First of all, the, there is a, in most economies, much more in the US and the UK than in, than in, than in, uh, than in continental Europe, but still, uh, still big there, underclasses have developed where people with severely disadvantaged backgrounds, low education, low skills, cannot move out of these areas into decent employment. So that's one big problem. The second big problem, and this, this, is, a bit, this is what many people think may be the huge problem for the next 20 or 30 years, which is so-called routine-based technical change. As computerization advances, automation advances, it can automate more and more jobs which can be in some way or another reduced to routines. As, uh, as artificial intelligence develops, that process, quite a lot of people believe, is going to accelerate so that things like driverless cars will, uh, as it were, eliminate the whole, a lot of the transport, people employed in the transport system. Uh, people argue that it's going to eliminate large parts of lower level legal services. So we have a very balanced picture of the modern knowledge economy. On the one hand, marvelous and exciting, uh, and that's what you will experience from it. On the other hand, problematic for large groups of people, including people who didn't go into the labor market with a good education. A lot of these people are older men, and phenomena like the UKIP phenomena is hardly a surprising phenomenon from that, from that perspective. We live in a world where we, we have more and more social cleavages between successful graduates in big cities, well-paid, and so on, with relatively secure jobs, and the people who, because probably because they were older, didn't have higher education, and it's very difficult for them to re-get higher education now, and to have much more fragile employment, employment prospects. Now, I'll, <laughs> I'm going to just spend two minutes, <laughs> one minute, says Vera, okay. Uh, say, <laughs> Just bringing politics, this has just taken long than I thought it was going to take, bringing politics into this. So the first really interesting question is, uh, what's brought all this about? Well, you needed, for all this to work, you needed, first of all, you needed globalization, and you needed a whole host of other institutional changes which came out of the political system. If you take the example of one very big country which almost certainly in the, at some stage in the 1960s, had the same, well, had access to the same computing facilities as in the West, namely the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, the, 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 uh, the, the, head of the, the heads of the Soviet Union said, we can't take the decisions to, uh, to open up our markets, to give individuals lots more freedom, and so on, which, if they were looking, looking ahead, this is a George Schultz, Schultz argument, actually, if they were looking ahead, they might, they might have seen. So here's a, a, a huge system, the, the, the Soviet system, which basically wasn't prepared to take the political decisions which would have been necessary for uh, for the IT revolution to have worked there. So political decisions were absolutely necessary. It's argued, some people argue, Piketty argues, uh, 
Whereas other people argue that this is that these decisions were imposed by advanced capitalism. But there are two reasons why advanced capitalism has actually been weakened uh, through this period. One is that multinationals can't move, can't threaten to move to exit and so on because they're, they're stuck in this world of sticky knowledge. The second is that product market competition has made companies compete with each other to a much greater degree. And because they compete with each other, it's become almost impossible for them to, to coordinate activity and to say to governments, right, we're going on an investment strike. That's no longer something which anybody remotely thinks of as, as possible. So we live in a world in which <clears throat> democracy actually seems to, for all the decisions which it takes, which may not be so, which may not be so good, democracy still clearly is highly effective in the advanced countries. And the big downside of all that is this. We should be relying on democracy to redistribute resources and end inequality or reduce inequality. But the winners from this whole process of a move to the knowledge economy uh, are not prepared to vote for parties which simply redistribute resources to the poor. So democracy, unfortunately, despite Piketty say, saying that the problem is, is, is that uh, democracy is being captured by advanced capitalism, it looks as though democracy hasn't been captured by advanced capitalism, but decisive voters aren't prepared to use democracy to reduce inequality. Okay.